We're back, and this is Mike and Susie again, and we're going to go on to, well, with when I was a little older, I was now about oh, 16, 17 years old, and I had my license, and uh, I was up in the Sonoma Mountains, actually in my friend's car this time. Up here, there's a spot in Petaluma, it's called the Old Adobe, or the Adobe Fort, and uh it's right next to uh, Old Adobe Road and Manor Lane. And um, if you go up that road there, that's where all the kids used to go. And that's where we used to hang out. And so <clears throat> we were up there, my friend and I. Um, once again, I'm not going to use his actual name. But I will call him Spike for this because that's what he's called in my book called Falling Sky. Spike. Spike and I were up in the uh, right-hand side of Manor Lane as it splits off and goes left or right. And we were sitting up there listening to his radio in his car. And we were talking hypothetically about, I wonder what this and I wonder what that. You know how kids do. And with that, um, I said, I wonder about this. And with that, Spike says to me, he says, Mike, what I wonder is, what is that? And he points over to the opposite mountain range in the, um, well, the uh, west mountain range. And he says, what is that? I said, it's the moon. I'm looking at the harvest moon over there, right? And I said, the moon, you moron. I said, okay. He says, if that's the moon, he says, and he points out the, his, his driver window where he's sitting up in the sky. He goes, what is that? And I look over, I bend down, look over, and I see another harvest moon up there. And I said, oh, that is odd. He says, now look again. As I'm staring at the moon in the sky, he says, look back over there across the mountain, sir. He says, there's two more, and just as I look over, there's two other ones, and they, they start rising on either side of it. So there's three moons over there and one moon above us, okay? That makes four moons, okay? And this is an impossible scenario. We know Earth only has one moon. So we're both going, oh, my God, what is this thing? What is going on? Susie, what would you think if you saw? You've seen things in your life later on, but let's just say we go back then, and you see something about these, like these Four moons. Well, what does Rashni tell you? I on, I wouldn't have believed what I saw. You know, I yeah. mean, because three moons is an impossibility. There's four you know, of them, though. Four? Yeah, there's. The, remember, there's three across in the west side and one above us, out out Spike's window. I stand corrected. You are absolutely right. There are four. Four, according to mm -hmm. that. So, knowing knowing that there's only one moon, it makes no rational sense there being well <laughs> four of them in the sky that night, right? That's true, absolutely. Okay, so Spike and I go, oh my God, these with these anyway. The one in the center over in the west, with just hovered in one position. The other two on the either side of it kept rising until they became full moons in the sky next to it from behind the mountain. But that Spike says, what's over there? I said, that is, he was new to the area. I said, that is uh, where Tamales is, I believe, out past the Two Rock Coast Guard base. He says, let's go over there. I said, oh, come on, dude. He said, let's go check it out. So with that, he starts his car and he flies across town. We go all the way across town. And I knew they were going to be gone by the time we got there. And sure as heck they were. But he pulls up to the... Uh, Coast Guard base, and there's a guard in the driveway, and he says, hey, did you guys see the, 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 the three moons over there? And there's one over there, and the guy says, and what have you been drinking tonight? I'm thinking, oh, man, dude, you're going to get us in a heap of trouble here. So I'm not in the mood for that. I told him to leave. And he just got into an argument with this guy. They denied seeing this, and blah, 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 and all. It just went south really fast. So we split, okay? We jammed home. The details to that, which I'm not going to get into, is in my book. When you read it, it's quite it's quite a detailed little chapter. It gets really weird after that. Um, I, I don't want to get into it because I want to get to cover some territory. So anyway, we are past that point, and now we are now into spring, and it is 1977. So it, when when Spike and I saw that, it had to have been winter of 76. I, I'm sus suspecting I had my license, so it had to be December. So December of 76, and now we're into spring of 77. And uh, my brother and I are up in the same mountains. It's nighttime, about 11.30 at night. We had two girls with us, um, and we were listening to music out there. Uh, we just pulled out. He'd gone to the left instead of the right where Spike and I had gone. My brother's name was Ron, and I'll 
to use his real name here because, well, he's my brother and I'm going to use it. And, well, he has passed away from complications from a lot of things. Um, but anyway, Ron, uh, we pull, he pulls his car out to the left side of Manor Lane. Then he pulls out into a field there, an open field. Uh, it was open pasture area. And he says, let's get out of the car, brother. I want to talk to you. We've just gotten off work. Um, and it's like 11.30, and we have the girls in the back seat of the car, and we go stand at the trunk. He pops the trunk of his car, and we're listening to music at the trunk. And I remember the actual <laughs> the, ta the tape we were actually listening to. He had just got was Thin Lizzy, Live and Dangerous. That's how I remember it. He loved that tape. And he was blaring it out of his trunk of his car, and he was kind of talking loud about that we, we'd put on the first song, and he starts talking, what do you think of these girls? We're going back and forth on this. And, he, and as we're talking, he says, what is that? And he points to behind me. And we, I look, turn around, and I look behind me, and there's a, there's a huge, huge tree there. And behind the tree in, in the bushes was what appeared to be a dome. It looked like an orange dome just glowing, radiating light all over the place coming from behind the tree. And I said, I don't know. And I turned around and said, what do you think it is? He said, I don't know, but look at it now, brother. He said, it's getting bigger. And I turn around, and he's right. The thing is growing. It's getting <laughs> two times the size of this darn tree. Seriously, it's just demonstrous, towering over it. I said, let's go check it out. He says, get in the car. We're leaving, brother. We're, de we're out of here. I said, no, come on, Ron. Let's go check it out. He says, get in the car now, or I'm leaving you up here. Now, my brother was going to leave me up there. What do you think of that, Susie? Oh, no, he definitely would have left you up there. Yes. <laughs> so that's Ron, right? Without a doubt. <laughs> that would be Ron. He'd say, you're, you're staying here, brother. He was going to leave me there, and so I didn't, I didn't question it. I hurried in the car. We get in the car, and he starts racing out of the mountains. As we get about halfway down the mountains, he goes, who touched my music? Now, mind you, we were only at the trunk of the car for about, well, not even a whole song. I, I remember he just put the tape in. He had an auto-reverse deck. And the deck had uh, just played the one song, and by the time we got back in, the deck had stopped. And so the two girls in the back seat go, you know, nobody touch your deck. It stopped playing. He says, oh, come on. You, you don't give me this. I'm not going to. He's pretty foul when he talks. He says, don't give me this SHI. So anyway, he, they go, where were you two? And these girls go, where were you two? And he says, we're at the trunk of the car. You didn't see that thing that we saw out there, the orange, big orange thing out there? And the, girl, the girls go, no, we, we looked for you. We couldn't find you anywhere. We, we were looking for your tape plate all the way through, flipped to the other side, and stopped playing. We got scared. We didn't know where you were. And with that, I go, I said, what? I said, we're out there for about five minutes. Now, right then, Susie, what would go through your mind? Here you are. You know you were out there for one song, if that. Now you get in the car and you have these girls telling you you've been out there for, well, a live and dangerous tape was about probably about a, at least a 45-minute tape, a very long tape. I don't know what the exact length of it was, but it's like 45 minutes. You've listened to maybe five minutes of a 45-minute tape, so there's 40 minutes missing. What's going through your mind? Well, probably you thought that the, uh, that the girls that you guys were with were messing with you. Well, only thing I knew is that we had seen something different there. I knew that there was something odd going on, and none of it was making sense. They didn't see what we saw either. That, that was another thing that went through my mind. We, we, and Ron was getting really PO'd at this moment, saying, calling him every name in the book, saying, how dare you? He was mad. He was furious. It was not nice. And when he got mad, he was not a nice guy. I got that from my dad, I guess. Um, anyway, we wound up dropping these girls off uh, back where we got them from and went home and called it a night, okay? Um, and neither one of us said another word about this incident. We never discussed it until about three days later. My brother says to me, he says, brother, you know what that thing was in the mountains? I go, I don't know, Ron. I, I wanted to go check it out and you wanted to leave. And he goes, that was God. I go, that's not God. I said, that's like, are you a lunatic? I said, that wasn't God. He goes, how would you know? He says, have you, have you ever seen God? I go, no, neither have you. He goes, yes, I have. I go, when? He goes, when my kid was born, um, she was born with her uh, intestines, liver, spleen, gallbladder, all the stuff on the outside of her. He said, I was working in the docks in, uh, in Richmond, in Richmond, California. He said, I was coming across the Richmond-San Rafael Bridge 
uh, it was morning. He, he worked a late shift, early shift, graveyard shift. He says it was just getting light out. And as I was coming across the Richmond San Rafael Bridge, I looked up in the sky. My daughter was in Children's Hospital in San Francisco. I was going to go over the San Francisco Bridge to see my kid. He says, and I saw, I was really bummed about everything, about what's happened with her. He says, and I look up in the sky and I saw that same thing we saw in the mountains. And um, he said, I knew right then and there my daughter was going to be okay, and she was. So that was God. I mean, I get kind of touched when, he, when I think about this because it's the first time I've really heard him talk about something like this. So I go, well, if it was God, I said, why didn't you want to go see him? He says, brother, I'm up in the mountains here. He says, I'm a divorced man now. He says, and I'm here with two girls, and, and I'm not doing things that I should be doing. He says, well, am I ready to meet God now? And I go, I guess you have a point. So we left it go at that. And oddly enough, uh, before he passed away, uh, which was 2005 when he did pass away, the one thing that he did ask me, he says, aren't you a preacher yet? And I said, why are you asking me that? And he goes, because the thing in the mountains, he said, it wasn't for me, it was for you, and I know it. So that's where that was um, lit off. He, he believed it was God, and at the time, I thought he was kind of um, out of his uh, gourd for thinking so. So some time went by. We're now in the early 80s. I had moved to, uh, I was now married. Well, actually, I want to back up a second here, because I met my wife right after this whole mountain spear thing with my brother. That's when Susie and I met was? 1978. 1978, okay. as she stated. And I didn't ever talk about any of this stuff with her because, well, like I said, I'm very, at that time in my life, I wasn't as boisterous about it as I am now. But I did when we were dating, of course, brought her up to those mountains too, okay? Um, mountains were a very popular spot. And I remember sitting I remember sitting up there and telling her about what I had seen up there with my brother and what I had seen up there with my friend. Those are the two incidents that I shared with her. And when I told her what I saw, Susie, what was your what was you what did you tell me when I said that about the things that we saw out there? What did you think? I thought you were crazy. I mean, you know, straight up. Yeah. I thought you were making it up. Absolutely, and I'd understand why. And that's why I didn't tell many people, because that was the first perception I got from people, is that, oh, he's insane. The guy's insane. So I kept it to myself. I didn't talk about it much. And uh, there was really no reason to really go on and vocalize about it to anybody, because that's the response I get. Uh, it wasn't very favorable and nice. And I still get the same response nowadays. I've just pushed through and forged through. And people are, in this world are starting to see things a little differently now. Anyway. Onward and upward, Susie and I managed to make through all of this and we get married. And we have our first child, our daughter. We're not gonna mention names once again, but we have our, our, our daughter. And um, we're living out, out uh, well, out in a cottage out in West Petaluma now. Um, by the way, the Mountain Sphere, my brother and I were living in an apartment in Petaluma uh, over, over uh, they were the Kenilworth Apartments in Petaluma, California. My wife met there, my wife and I met while I was living there. Then we moved to West Petaluma, out in the country again. Um, out on Eucalyptus Avenue, that's as much as I'll give you, is I was out on Eucalyptus Avenue, um, which is off Bodega. We lived in a small cottage on a hill, and it was very secluded, extremely secluded. I mean, we had to walk quite a distance just to even get to our car to, for grocery shopping or anything else. Um, what was the winter like, Susie, with groceries and stuff to tell people? Very, very, very muddy. It was, you know, I mean, you had a hike all the way up in the mud, and if it was wet, you know. It was really tough, and it was uh, like roughing it almost out in the, out in the wilds. <laughs> it almost felt like you are in the wilds. Oh, definitely. And we used, to heat, <laughs> we, used to, we used to heat the cottage with, well, the pellet stove, of course, and not the pellet stove, but the air high, airtight fireplace. We didn't have a pellet stove. I want to recant that. It was an airtight fireplace, and we used to heat with a kerosene heater. And, uh, well, we kept the kerosene down in a barn, and we'd fill our little portable kerosene heater. We'd use that when we didn't feel like chopping wood or whatever. So it's one night I'm getting off work. It's, I don't remember what night it was. I'm going to be honest. I, even things like this happen, you don't remember, and you don't reflect upon You don't think about them until afterwards, or you reflect upon them. We need the kerosene for the heater. 
and I asked her if she wants to start a fire, and she says, no, I'll go get kerosene. What happened? She, she went down to the barn to get kerosene. Tell us what happened at, on your trip down to the barn when you went to get kerosene. Well, I walked down to the barn, you know, with a can, and uh, go to approach where the kerosene was kept. You know, I opened the door, and uh, I heard just like just a shh, you know, and at first I thought, well, maybe it was the wind, but then it, it didn't sound like wind. It sounded like voices, like people were talking. So you were but there was no one out there. You're hearing voices in the middle of this field. Well, yes, at the barn there. That's right. In the dark at night. Yes, 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 yes. yes. So I, I, I dropped the can. I ran up and I got you. I told you to go get it, you know, because there was voices out there. And there shouldn't have been anything out there. Needless to say, when she came up, I felt <laughs> exactly like people thought about me. She's insane. There's nothing down there. I said, what did you hear? I said, what did you hear? A skunk? A possum? What else was he? What? Oh, no, 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 no. It was voices. You heard voices. Let's, let's, let's reenact this. So you heard voices, okay? What, yeah, you know, people what type talking. Of, what type of voice? What do you mean you heard voices? How, who's down Just the, people talking. People talking in the barn? Outside the barn. Outside the barn? Uh-huh. In the middle of this field? Yes, and but there's nothing out there. And okay. I knew it since I had just been out there. So I said, where's the kerosene can? I said, down at the barn, because I just dropped it and ran, you know. Okay, so I said, I'm going down to get the kerosene. I said, we need heat, I'm freezing. So I head down there. So what are you, what are you telling me before I go? I'm telling you, uh, we can just go to bed. You didn't need to go back down there. I said, no, I want kerosene. I want, I want to go get the kerosene. I was cold. You so, did, yeah. So you like you listened to me. So you just went and did what you wanted to do. That's what I did. I headed yeah. down to the barn. And figured, She's insane. <laughs> There's no voices down there. What's wrong with her? So I go down there. I go to the barn, and I go to the back of the barn. And think, Freaking nuts! She's crazy. She's hearing voices down here now. So anyway, I go to the back of the barn, and as I'm, I, I open a can of kerosene, and I start pumping the kerosene in, and it's windy here. And in the wind, I said, it's just wind. That's what she heard. And all of a sudden, here, in the wind, I go, what the hell? And I stop pumping. And I go, who's there? Well, she's dead silence. I hear the wind going. I go, who's there? And there's no answer. I start pumping a little more with that ear. With the wind going here, my. I go, oh, my. God, there is something down here. I go, who is here? I just kept pumping. I keep pumping and pumping and pumping the kerosene. And I fill it up and I keep hearing the wind. And as I put the cap back on it, I shut out the flashlight, cap the kerosene off, hung up the pump on the wall, and I started jamming on there. I'll hear, Mike. I go, oh my God, she is hearing voices down there. I fly up there with the kerosene, lock the door, I flew up through the field in the dark, almost tripping with this kerosene can. And as I get in the house, I said, you did hear something down there. I don't know what the hell it was that you heard something. There was something really off going on there. There was nothing there. And like, it's, like she says, this shed is in the middle of nowhere. It's in the middle of my parents' house, in the middle of, uh, of other uh, my brother's house. And their lights were out. They were in bed. And it's like I, there was nothing down there to be calling our names. When I told her that, I said, it's really weird. Not only were there voices, but it was calling my name. And she said, that is strange. Absolutely, oh. that is totally strange. I mean, you know, it, it, it called right out for him. I thought it was bizarre. I didn't, really didn't know what to think of it personally. And, and I thought, at first, I thought she was cracking up. She wasn't. I heard the same thing she heard. She wasn't cracking up at all. I don't know what it was at that particular point. But here's okay. Now here we go. We've got you got the incident in the atrium. Okay, we've got the uh, incident in the tree fort. Okay, those are two incidents were very mild. Atrium one was a little more. Uh, more forceful, more abrupt, because as a kid, them telling me they're my parents. Um, that's kind of abrupt. Then there's the tree fort. I didn't even know I was missing, but I was. We've got the incident in the dark room when my dad goes out there and I'm missing, but I was out there. I knew I was in the dark room, so there's time missing in both of these. Then the balls uh, with the uh, with the bus stop with my brother Rich and I. Okay, when there's missing time there, where the bus is supposed to be there ten minutes early and it's. We're supposed to be stopped in this early, and we're actually there on time. They made sure I was there on time. 
Um, then there's the incident of my dad seeing the lights in the field when I was home alone. So I don't know how much missing time I could have had there. I don't. I really don't. He just saw the orbs in the field, okay? Uh, then we've got the four moons that I saw with my friend later on. Then the moon behind the uh, tree and up in the same mountains with my brother and the two girls. And now we've got these voices in the night in this shed where our kerosene is kept. This is a lot of events up to this point already. And this is just the beginning of the nutshell. This is, this is just that we haven't even cracked it open yet. I mean, I've not even opened this shell yet. These are just like preludes or introductions to what's going to happen. And we're going to take a break right there. We'll be back. You can find all of these stories and more in Michael Davis's book, Falling Sky. To order Falling Sky, simply Google Michael Davis Falling Sky and click the Amazon Kindle link. You can also visit Amazon and search Michael Davis Falling Sky. <laughs> 